Hello, and welcome to Dog Food with Catherine Abel, telling stories about dogs that feed your mind and spirit. Tom McCall is jerked out of a deep, desperately needed sleep at 3 a.m. on Saturday morning. He has been working 27 straight days of 14-hour shifts. There are so many staff members down from the pandemic that he had no choice. The hospital where he works in Alabaster, Mississippi, is overrun nearly every day with victims of the virus. He had no choice until his co-workers were cleared for return. Just the day before, the hospital admitted 30 new patients. It seemed to never end. The fear and sadness were beyond stressful. So when two pairs of strong, aggressive hands grabbed him up and out of his bed, he barely knows what's happening. He's just so tired. Every molecule and atom of his body, brain and spirit, is exhausted to the extreme. He's so lethargic that the people saving him assume he has taken sleeping pills. They could not get him to wake up. Not until he was standing in the parking lot in front of the blazing inferno that was once his home and the homes of the Zellers, the Moraleses, and Tina, whose last name he doesn't know and only knows her first name because it's appliqued in bright pink 12-inch cursive on the rear windshield of her black Toyota 4Runner. If he saw her in the grocery store, he doubted he'd be able to recognize her. He and the other families who lived in the quadruplex of two-story townhomes rarely saw one another. Tom had purchased the home, his first, four years ago, shortly after he'd turned 24. He knew the Zellers had had a baby two years ago and that this had made them friendlier and more outgoing. When he was outside with Mabel, they would stop and chat now, rather than simply smiling hello and then disappearing inside their home or cars. Mabel! My God, where is Mabel? Tom comes fully awake when he realizes his dog Mabel is nowhere to be seen. Violently, he breaks free from the hands holding him and runs toward the leaping flames, screaming over and over again, Mabel! Mabel! At the top of his lungs, he screams his pet's name in the hope she'll appear safe and unharmed any second. But she does not appear, and even when the two firemen tackle him to the ground, he continues to scream his dog's name at the top of his voice. Mabel! Mabel! God! One week later, a quiet and very still and still very tired Tom McCall is standing in front of the blackened hull that was once his home. In his right hand are the last three of the 250 flyers he'd printed up and posted, alerting readers, dog lovers, and chihuahua appreciators that his dog is missing and possibly scared out of her wits and surely very hungry. He watches Mr. and Mrs. Morales as they speak with their insurance adjuster. He hears a car drive up behind him. The motor turns off, a door opens and closes. He becomes vaguely aware of a human presence beside him. Tom? He tears his eyes from his home and his mind from the beseeching prayer to look at the woman who has spoken his name. I'm Tina. I live on the inn next to the Morales' family. How are you? I heard you lost your dog. Has there been any news? I posted a photo of your flyer online. I hope that's okay. Tom stares blankly at the young, slender woman beside him. He hears her voice and what she said, but his mind is far away in sorrowful grief which blocks him from understanding the words. He mutters, Thank you. Two words that are usually the polite response at any point in any conversation. Her name is Mabel, right? I used to see you walking her. She's a good, pretty girl, Tina says. She looks at the man who's about her age, though six inches taller than she, skin almost as dark as hers, dark brown hair much shorter, eyes more unfocused and stricken with unspeakable pain. Would you like to talk about her? She asks. Tom looks at Tina and understands the words and the request. He sees the kindness in her eyes and knows the question is sincere. What can he tell her? How can he describe the tremendous loss and suffering he's enduring because of the absence of his dog? Does he start at the beginning? Because that's what he's remembering, the very beginning and every moment since. 
Tom worked. That's what he did. His father was killed in a car accident when he was eight years old, and he's been working ever since. He had no brothers or sisters. His cousins lived in Atlanta, Georgia. He met them the one and only time at his father's funeral. The accident that took the life of his father occurred at 7.30 on a Tuesday morning. His father was on his way to his law office. The overworked driver of the 18-wheeler had dozed off for two seconds, and when he jerked back awake, his right hand pulled down hard on the steering wheel. This caused his massive rig to roll rapidly into the right lane where the mid-sized SUV his father was driving was struck with the full force of the 80,000 pounds of truck and trailer going 70 miles an hour. His father never stood a chance. The truck's front right tires rolled right over the driver's side, killing his dad instantly. The rest of the 18-wheeler took off the top half of the SUV, making an open casket funeral unreasonable. His mother was strongly advised by his law partners and their assistants to not visit the crash site. Mrs. McCall had looked into the red, tear-soaked eyes of her husband's secretary of 10 years and chosen to follow the advice. His father had been liked and admired by every single person in the law firm, from the cleaning personnel to the ground maintenance crew to the lawyers' husbands and wives to the interns and assistants, but most of all, He'd been tremendously liked and respected by his law partners. Their fondness for him was proven when the settlement check was issued to his widow and her only child. Those lawyers had fought and studied and learned and went after that trucking company like a chicken gets after a snake in the hen house. They learned of the trucking company's predatory practices with their employees, how they forced them to drive too many hours in too short a time or risk unemployment. Though the driver had been driving the vehicle that killed Albert McCall, it was in fact the trucking company that murdered him and by unflagging efforts was charged with manslaughter and made to pay millions to Mr. McCall's wife and only son. When the unsavory practices were revealed and substantiated, they quickly dropped all charges against the driver. As part of the settlement, the trucking company had to pay for counseling service and all back pay owed. This allowed the driver to quit and moved to Mexico, where he lives to this day making handcrafted dining tables he sells online for just prices. He has yet to get behind the wheel of another vehicle. The counseling helped, but not quite enough. Tom went to work a week after his father died. He was qualified to do nothing, so did everything he could. He mowed lawns, raked leaves, planted flowers and trees, washed cars, cleaned gutters, fed and trapped feral cats for TNR programs, cleaned stables, painted fences, and walked people in wheelchairs on sidewalks and round and round and round the interior halls of nursing homes. He worked through elementary, middle school, high school, and college. When he finally recognized his vocation and love was helping people, he quit work, hunkered down, and focused on nursing school. He graduated at the top of his doctoral class and was working full-time as a registered nurse practitioner when the fire consumed his home, and possibly something much worse. Does he tell Tina how he got Mabel? That it was an accidental sighting, but pure love at first sight? He'd been loading groceries into his car at the grocery store. He'd just finished all of the weekly shopping for his mother and the neighbors on either side of her when he noticed a woman unloading a shiny black metal crate from the back of her mid-sized SUV. Something compelled him to drive over to the parking lot of the veterinarian's office next door to the grocery store. He doesn't know how to explain it, only that something quiet and gentle had urged him in that direction. He learned from the woman that she was a licensed breeder, and inside the crate was the last litter. She was not only retiring her dogs, she was retiring herself as well. She was there at the vet's office to get the four bright-eyed puppies their final set of shots. Then, she informed him, they'd be ready for their forever families and homes. Two of the puppies were golden tan. One was solid white with black over his eyes and on his ears. The fourth was a solid black female with two tan dots above each eye, two tan dots on each cheek, and tan on her nose that ran lightly down her neck and onto her tiny little chest. 
She had stark white whiskers on her nose and poking out of her eyebrows. When she looked up at Tom, something happened inside of him which he thought was unique, but was actually a soul stirring shared by every parent the moment he or she first lays eyes on their newborn child. A love so wondrous and compelling and instantly protective that it robs one of speech. She was the most perfect creation he'd ever seen. The dog breeder, wearied and wise, recognized the moment for exactly what it was, a match well and truly made. Tom accompanied her to the vet's office, where the breeders transferred Mabel's information from her records to his. She then led him to the shelves, where there was a staggering choice of canned and bagged food. As he held the tiny eight-week-old puppy in his left hand, she kindly shared her years of experience while thanking God for her gift of discernment. This young man, she instinctively knew without a doubt, was fine and good. She enjoyed the gentle manner with which he handled the puppy and his healthy, doting manner. Mabel had hit the jackpot. When Tom left his vet's office, yes, he had a vet now. He had Mabel, a copy of her records, enough food for a month, and an appointment for the day after next for the home visit by the breeder. He'd never understood the profound mystery of having a dog. He'd see pet lovers and their animals and considered it a little foolish, all of the money and time spent on a dog. Though he had grown up with a big black dog named Sam because his father loved all animals and there was always a dog in his home. But there were not pet toys, beds, or clothes for dogs, but the dog was a companion and one of the family. Thinking back on it now, Tom thinks that maybe his father didn't buy toys because Sam played with Tom, and his father didn't buy beds because Sam slept on their bed. He'd never given it any thought until now. As he drives to his mother's home with extra careful attention, he grins down at his baby and says, I get it. I totally get it now, Mabel. What does Tom actually get? What happened in the blink of an eye that changed his life forever? How could he ever explain to anyone the connection he felt when she looked up at him? Her trusting brown eyes had looked into his unsuspecting brown eyes, and the world had tilted. There had been an instantaneous and inexplicable connection between himself and a long-haired chihuahua puppy. When their eyes met, he just knew that she was supposed to belong to him and he to her. She was his, and he was hers. It was elusively unnameable, yet it was a fact. It was as though Mabel had been made just for him. She's calm and confident and feels like she weighs as much as a feather. He's now responsible for the care and guidance and nurturing of another life. He hopes he can give her just a tiny piece of the joy that she, even now, is giving him. At a red light, he looks down to watch her gently gnaw on the knuckle of his index finger. Her little body is tucked neatly in his lap. His world had begun to expand in ways he would never have imagined. Is it possible that his heart has actually increased in size? When he'd arrived at his mother's, she'd been thrilled to meet his new companion. Mrs. McCall couldn't help but worry about her only child, the long hours he worked, the hours he spent alone, it wasn't right for a young man to be alone so much. She knows Tom is a solitary creature, a quiet, contemplative man who enjoyed and was recharged by solitude. He cared so much for others and exerted so much effort and time helping them that she knew her son would probably never marry, never have children. And she was perfectly all right with this because she knew Tom would not stop giving and one had to have a reprieve to stay sane. When she saw his face and how his demeanor was different, lit up, brighter, she didn't know what had happened, but whatever it was, she loved it. He needed, he deserved to be happy and joy-filled. When she saw the source of his joy, she could not have been more pleased. She knew what a fine mind and character the good Lord had given her son, that in spite of losing a father so young, Tom had been blessed. She was ever confident that something would happen in his life to alleviate the stress and burden of work and living every day. He had grown up with a dog, 
His father loved all animals. They'd had a family pet who was the same age as Tom when his father had been killed. On the day Tom was born, Mr. McCall, to celebrate the birth of their child, had gone to the local shelter and gotten whatever puppy they would let him have. Buster, Mr. McCall's boxer, had passed away one month after they learned of her pregnancy. Buster had been with him for 12 years and could barely walk when he went from this life into the next. Mr. McCall was devastated by the loss and could not bear to have another pet. But with the news of a child on the way, his sorrow grew less intense. Still, he couldn't bring himself to so eagerly replace Buster. When Mr. McCall brought Sam home, a black ball of fur who would grow into a huge dog of unknown combined breeds, Mrs. McCall had loved the dog just as much as her husband had, as had Tom. In Mississippi, a person had to work hard not to have a dog or a cat. Companion animals were literally everywhere, with no spay-neuter laws in place and an inborn contempt for all that wasn't human, so many just didn't care. They were running loose in the streets. People could see seven male dogs assaulting an in-heat female in a ditch on the sides of the roads every single day. Cars and trucks just passed by, with not a thought to the actual horror of the sight. Because where would those puppies go? Every single shelter that was open was overflowing, and they never stopped coming in. One female and her offspring can produce somewhere around 67,000 dogs in one single year. What would happen to those dogs? What would happen to 67,000 dogs in Mississippi? Death. Death is what would happen, and does happen pretty much anyway, every single day in Mississippi and all over the world. Mississippians aren't the only ones who don't have any sense when it comes to caring for animals. The statistics repulsively prove it. The McCalls were educated individuals, and they made sure that Tom was as well. They educated him with books, reason, compassion, and love. They asked him, if God cares for all the animals in his creation, should he? Years ago, Sonny, an eight-year-old brown, full-blooded standard poodle, had been seen wandering the streets. She had so much matted hair that it was not known what breed she was. Mrs. McCall and her friends had caught her and taken her immediately to the vet, then to the groomers. That dog was absolutely stunning. And smart, she was almost like having another person around. Mrs. McCall had loved Sonny so much, so much that three years later she hadn't fully stopped grieving for her. Some days... She wishes Tom had never taught her how to take photos with her phone. She probably had more photos of Sonny than of Tom. Mabel's charm and energy had dispelled the remaining grief immediately. They'd never had little dogs. How curious it was that Tom had chosen her. Or was it the other way around, she wonders. It felt so good to have a dog back in the house. They were both so timid and careful with her at first neither one of them wanting to accidentally step on her or harm her in any mistaken, bumbling way. Those fears soon disappeared when the boldness of her personality became evident. She was proud and sassy and territorial and loving, and they loved her to bits. Mabel thrived under their care. She enjoyed a life of steady love, mental stimulation, and exercise. Does he tell Tina of that first day and night when he brought her home, how when he put her down in the little yard out back that she'd use the bathroom immediately, right on the grass like she was supposed to, without him having to say a word? He'd praised her as she so richly deserved and then invited her to follow him inside. His natural inclination had been to pick her up, but he knew if he engaged in the act, it would become a habit, and he'd never put her down. That was the easy way. Mabel would not become one of those spoiled, pouty chihuahuas with no muscle tone. She'd be lean and sporty, like him. Look how little she is. He's both charmed and alarmed by her diminutive size. She barely covers the span of his palm. The breeder told him that long-haired chihuahuas are the smallest breed in the world. Mabel will only weigh six pounds when she's fully grown. Has he lost his mind or found his way? 
When she comes inside, the first thing she does is chew on the leg of one of the tables his mother had made. At this point, he does pick her up. He doesn't scold her, but hugs her close and kisses the top of her little head. For love is patient and love is kind. It doesn't envy or boast. It doesn't dishonor others and is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. At the pet store, he buys toys to redirect, chew toys to quench the need to chew, and a red leather collar and leash. A retractable leash, a crate big enough for a cocker spaniel to use, and a doghouse, both of which will never be used and whose purposes will remain a mystery to Mabel all of her days. He buys ten different dog beds because there's such marvelous choice and variety, and, well, because he loves her and wants her to feel cherished and safe. He does not buy treats. He knows giving a tiny dog treats is a bad practice to begin and should never be allowed the opportunity to rise. She'll require so little food that what she receives at mealtime will be plenty. He truly enjoys all of the attention she receives. Everyone had oohed and awed over her and wanted to know her story. He told them everything he could, never tiring of the repetitive fact-giving. Tom's work took on a deeper meaning, and he enjoyed greater rewards. He had a living and precious responsibility now. His main job now was to take care of Mabel and make sure he could always provide for her. He began to be more responsible financially. He stopped all gaming activities so he had time to walk her or spend time watching her play in the backyard. He wasn't such a pushover at work anymore. He never needed to work overtime, but he would fill in whenever asked, which was all of the time because everyone knew Tom would never say no. Now he never worked overtime, and the strangest thing happened. The slackers stopped slacking once their enabler stopped enabling them. Mood and morale blossomed in his office. A caring environment became one of trust as well. As Mabel grew, he exercised her as her age and breed allowed. Backyard play turned into neighborhood strolls. He got the exercise bug, yet knew Mabel could never walk as far or as fast as he could. So he bought a mountain bike and added a sturdy woven basket on the front. This allowed them to ride for many miles on the nearby levee. Mabel was comfortably and safely ensconced in the basket on breathable cotton padding. He would stop from time to time to let her run in front of him. She loved to run, and he could tell she loved to believe she was way faster than he. He'd pedal in slow motion with a grin on his face as he watched her little legs churn up the dirt. Sometimes he'd pass her just so he could look back at her happy face, mouth grinning, eyes alight with abundant joy. Her tiny body didn't have an ounce of fat on it. She was pure, lean muscle under her black flowing hair. Her back thighs were oversized, filled with strength and health. Tom is a solitary man with not one gregarious bone in his body. Yet since getting Mabel, he has talked and laughed more than in his entire life. She taught him to slow down, to relax, to enjoy each moment. On sunny days, he sat in the reclining lawn chair in his backyard and watched butterflies for hours as they fed on the red and yellow blooms of a lantana bush. Mabel would watch, stalk, and jump up as high as she could to try to catch one. She was never successful, but that didn't dim her enjoyment one bit. Tom began to practice deep breathing techniques, and as his lungs expanded, so did his consciousness. People started talking to him all the time. They couldn't seem to help themselves once they saw the cuteness overload that was Mabel. They were drawn by her bright eyes and perky attitude. They admired her black fur and the becoming tan markings on her face that made it look as though she were on the verge of speaking. All were marked on the softness and beauty of her coat. So many had to stop and engage in the oh-so-petite wonder that was Mabel McCall. He has shared surprising, meaningful conversations with strangers because of people wanting to meet his Mabel, young, old, all colors, all sizes. Her preciousness is the sweetest magnet, and the calm, kind demeanor of her master encourages them without words to approach and speak. 
Because he tell Tina how Mabel changed his life? That she had made him a better man? That this little dog had taught him the value of being alive? Where is she? He has failed her miserably. Mabel! Tom yells, startling Tina. Mabel! Tom yells again. And Tina sees the tears falling down his cheeks and realizes she cannot fathom the loss this man has suffered, that she has no words of comfort for him. Or does she? Mabel! Tina yells, even louder than Tom, startling the insurance adjuster and the moralesis. The insurance adjuster looks over his clients and is about to roll his eyes when it dawns on him that someone has lost a beloved pet. He looks at the moralesis and sees the sadness in the elderly couple's eyes as they stare at the two young people yelling their lungs out. He's about to open his mouth to say something altogether different when he hears himself yelling, Mabel! Right along with the two young people. He has four cats, two goats, three Shetland ponies, and four loyal and loving stray dogs he picked up off the sides of Texas roads in his travels. He knows what it means to love animals and how vital they become to one's life. Tom is yelling her name. Tina is yelling her name. The stranger with the moralesis is yelling her name. And then the moralesis have joined the one-word chorus, shouting for Mabel, shouting for a terrible, faultless tragedy that has struck each of their lives, shouting to let Tom know they care for him and feel the tremendous suffering of his loss. When the Zellers drive up, they see their neighbors and a stranger are yelling as loud as they can. The strain on their faces and the upheaval of their chest tell of their passionate exertions. Zeke Zeller rolls down the window to hear what the ruckus is about. He hears the desperation, the dejectedness, the cathartic release, and he joins in as he and his family exit the car. Soon they are shouting in unison the name of the one who would not be found the name of the one who became terrified of the heat and noise and the anxiety of the humans, the name of the one who in the pitch blackness became lost and disoriented. Tom, his neighbors, and the stranger shout the name of Mabel, the little dog who was a family member, a companion, and a delight in the life of this good man. They call and call and call. Zeke Jr. begins to laugh and clap his hands, he squirms with all of his might until his mother must put him down. When his feet touch the earth, he runs straight toward Tom's blackened door, or so Zonya thinks. But it's not to the door that Zeke Jr. runs. With Zonya chasing after him, it's toward the shattered front window. When Zonya reaches the window, she stops calling the name of Mabel, and turning to them all, yelling anew, Mabel! But with a much different tenor. Her voice is louder than them all, and she's pointing at the window, pointing excitedly until they all fall silent. Because they see what Zeke Jr. sees, what Tom now sees, the soot-stained, too-skinny figure of Mabel McCall trembling in confusion and fear as she waits in the smelly and empty house for Tom to come get her. All sorrow evaporates, as they watch Tom sprint toward his home to reach past the windowless window to gently retrieve his little dog. The stress, the worry, it all disappears, never to return, as the Zellers, the Moraleses, Tina, and the insurance adjuster witness the sweet reunion of Tom and Mabel. When he turns toward them, his face, neck, and shirt are covered in soot. The fear and confusion is gone from Mabel's luminous brown eyes, while Tom's joy-filled eyes can't stop looking at his precious charge. Everyone comes close to Tom, and soon soot covers all hands, shirts, and faces. By the time Tom walks to his car, Mabel's soft coat once again glistens like silk, and the tan dots and stark white whiskers above her eyes and on her cheeks are as clean as as they've ever been. Thank you for listening to this episode of Dog Food with Catherine Abel. Until next time. <laughs>